As the United Church in BC celebrates several anniversaries this year, it always benefits us to listen to our early pioneers, to help us face the decades ahead. Tonight, Lois Boyce talks with a very special woman on The Pressure Point. Welcome to Pressure Point. I'm Barbara Anderson and tonight we have a very special program for you. 1985 is the 60th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. It was 60 years ago in 1925 that three of the country's major Protestant denominations merged together to form the union of what we now call the United Church. But it wasn't until 11 years later, in 1936, that the first woman was ordained into the United Church. Lydia Grushi had extensive theological training and served the church as a deaconess for many years, until at the urging of Dr. Oliver, who was the moderator at that time, she became the first woman to be ordained into the United Church. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have a conversation that Lois Boyce had with Reverend Grushi at her home in White Rock just a few weeks ago when they talked about what it was like to be a part of the church in those days. 1985, the United Church of Canada, 60 years old. And on this, the occasion of this Diamond Jubilee, it seems appropriate to look at some of the diamonds that have given service to the church over the years. And we're going to be talking to one of those people, uh, the, right, uh, the uh, Reverend Dr. Lydia Grucci. Welcome to uh, a, a show for, for the 60th anniversary, Dr. Grucci. Thank you. It's my understanding you were the first ordained woman in the United Church of Canada. That's right. And what year were you ordained? Beg your pardon? What year were you ordained? Oh, in, in 1936. 1936. There wouldn't be very many uh, women in other churches at that time. Were there other women in other churches ordained no, at that time? No, no. Not in the standard churches. Not in the standard churches. So it's my understanding you gave all your service to the church in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Uh, as a minister. As a minister. Yes. You did. But I understand you got there by way of France and England, and uh, I tell us a little bit about where you were born and your family. Well, my father was a Jerseyman. Yes. And uh, there's a place, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, where Jean-François Millet was uh, born, called Grouchy, in uh, the western part of France. Evidently, the Grouchys came from uh, from France into Jersey, so that that's our background, Norman uh, background. I see. And did you have many brothers and sisters? Oh yes, there were ten of us in the family. Ten? <laughs> well, that's a good family. And yeah. then you went to England. You went to boarding school in England. You went to boarding school in England, and then. And when I f when I uh, finished uh, what would correspond to grade twelve, there, I was in the. Uh, civil service for a year or two in, in London. I see. The post office. Oh, I see. <laughs> and then you joined your brothers who had come to Saskatchewan to Homestead. That's right. I see. My father brought the, the my two older sisters were ma married then, and uh, my father brought, when he retired, the three, the four youngest girls brought them out here and you to, were one to of the those. farm in the Saskatchewan. Yeah. I see. Well, that would be quite a big change in your life. Oh, yes, for all of us. <laughs> for all of you. And then you taught school, is that right? Yes. When you came to Saskatchewan? Yes. Uh -huh. And then how did you get into the ministry? Well, it was a pioneer times in Saskatchewan. It was after the First World War and the uh, Central European uh, immigrants were coming in. And the Presbyterian Church undertook to train leaders for Christian education among the new Canadians. And uh, they offered me a scholarship to take the special training for that mm -hmm. at the Presbyterian College in uh, Saskatoon. So I accepted that scholarship and took the two years training. And then I was so interested, I finished the, th the third year uh, on my own at the college. 
Then I was ready for ordination, although I hadn't planned to go in if they, anybody had asked me if I wanted to be ordained. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't uh, at, the, at the time. But I found in the work that I really needed ordination because it wasn't all just Christian education in the schools. There were congregations that needed minister and uh, Children needed to be baptized. And now we're talking about the early 20s. This would be before church union. Yes. In in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan, yes. Tell us about that. That must have been pretty primitive pioneer times. They, they wouldn't have paved roads and, and very oh, no. competent cars. How did you get around? On horseback. On horseback. <laughs> and now, uh, if I recall correctly, on the prairies, they used to have more than one a point. What oh, is yes. there? Several points in the charge or something. That's right. And and they wouldn't be right side by side. I don't yeah, expect. No, I had quite a. Oh, I think what was it around uh, between twenty and thirty miles to to go around between the different points. <laughs> <laughs> and so there would be lots of lonely women there. And and. Yes. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, we always think of the disadvantages and and the hardships of a woman being a minister? But it must uh, they must have been glad to have a woman to talk to. Uh, oh, I think so. I uh, always was very welcomed in the homes, and uh, I think I fitted into the home situation perhaps more easily than a man would. He, when a minister comes, it's rather a formal occasion, usually. Oh, yes. When I was a child, it certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think a, a woman coming in, you just take thing, potluck, <laughs> the, the way things are. You pick up the tea towel and dry the dishes. <laughs> yes, if that's what is going on. <laughs> and then uh, you're freer with the children and everything like that. And I think the women were, well, we were more on an equal footing. Now, uh, wasn't this about the time that the Duke of Boris arrived? Yes, it was. Uh, and they, I was right where they came, in uh, Berrigan. The place called very good. Oh, very very <laughs> Named uh, after their leader, I take yes, it. Yes, eh? quite. Yes, and uh, and did you teach their children? Um, that was before I was ordained. Before you were ordained, was yes. Uh -huh. I, was I was a teacher. They. Oh yes, uh, the boys were coming to school. They had quite a few boys, yes. but no girls, which didn't seem very normal. So, and we had to send in the names of the families. Uh, that were not attending school uh, to Regina, and then they got in touch with them. So one day, one of the chiefs came uh, to see me, and he said, I got this, showing me a form, form letter from Regina, and I read it. I said, uh, does that mean girls have to go to school? <laughs> I said, that's what it said. This was one of the Dukapur chiefs, was yes, it? Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we talked about it. He said, girls don't need school. We maybe go back to Russia. Well, I said, they, they know if they can speak English, there could be an asset to them there. Well, maybe we don't go. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he said, do they have to go? I said, yes. So he said, I bring them Monday. And Monday, a uh, wagon load of girls came. A wagon load? Yeah, you know, about a dozen of them, from uh, age, uh, just school age, six, seven, uh, to fourteen or so, leaving age. Now, do I understand those girls had never been at school before? No, but they were not illiterate. They could read or write in Russian. They were so their parents school. would yes. teach them uh -huh. at home. And so what, they just worked on the farms, is that it? That was the yes. role for, for yes. or Duke of War girls at that time? The attendance went up for, to, at the school from uh, about 30 or so when I first went, a rural school. Yes. So, with all the grades. With all the grades. And then these extra, it went up to around 72. <laughs> My goodness! For <laughs> so, one teacher? Well, then the, uh, the, school, it, the school, it was an official trustee because there's nobody locally that could do the work, uh, uh, sent another teacher and we divided the schoolroom. She taught on one side, I taught on the other. And, uh, 36 students each. 
Oh, about that is. <laughs> oh, well, we today we would think that was... Uh, oh, we didn't think that was too many. 72 was too many. <laughs> <laughs> and all in one room. Yes. Isn't that it amazing? It was a little crowded. <laughs> I can imagine that. I can imagine but that. But we, we managed. It must have been a full time with uh, the different charges that you had when you were a minister. Uh, and uh, tell us just about what would your week involve to get to see all those people. What could you do? Yes. Well, um, I visited the several schools. Uh, probably one each day for the last half hour of school when it was we were allowed to have Christian education. Oh yes. Churches mm -hmm. were allowed to have the last half hour of school. Oh I see. And the children were allowed to go home if the parents wished it. But they never did. They, they didn't. Stayed. And uh, it was teaching the Bible. It wasn't uh, proselytizing but uh, it was Bible uh, instruction, religious instruction that way but not the denominational at all. So you go so to the different schools? So my afternoons were like that uh, at that time, mm -hmm. and then coming and going, I would visit some of the homes between uh, the schools. That was uh, throughout the week. And then if it was on Sunday, I'd have uh, at least three services, uh, morning, afternoon, and uh, later afternoon. <laughs> And go around on horseback to the different ones. To the different ones. And then eventually I take it that you got a car. Oh, yes. Yes. But the roads maybe were more suitable for the horse than the car. Well, at <laughs> the beginning, certainly. Yes, that it would be. And, and then, of course, there was the uh, CGIT started. And oh, the for the girls. The and that sort of thing, just to put in time. <laughs> just to put in time. And you did all of this. And with the... Uh, oh, well, sometimes there was... Uh, there was there was some help, some yes. of the teachers. Would, and there'd be uh, Texas boys and trail rangers? Uh, uh, for the boys? Or, yes. were, or were they occupied on the farm more, maybe? Well, there wasn't too much, I suppose, among the boys, for the boys. But, uh, oh, they were... I, I had to supervise it. Yes, yes, but, and uh, to they see that the it went. local people. They'd be uh, so usually somebody in the bank and somebody in the school. Just, uh, that would help that out. That were able to help. And then there'd be all the births and deaths and marriages. Oh, yes. Not marriages, not until I was ordained. This would be uh, the time when a lot of new people would be coming and homesteading in the press. Yes, that's right. I was under the uh, supervision of the Home Mission Board of the Presbyterian and the United uh, Church. So you and, went to Presbyterian uh, until uh, 1925, when it was right. union. That's right, and then the uh, United and uh, uh, I was uh, really in the position of uh, a student, in a way, or home missionary. I see that you didn't, you couldn't do uh, the marriages and births right. and deaths uh, like you couldn't do that. Uh, That's right. Like Apart an ordained from minister. that, I did, but I had to call in the neighboring minister every time they needed a, a baptism or. Uh, the um, or a wedding, uh, we yes, yes, and uh, they really put in the petition for my ordination because I, I needed the ordination to do the work. I it see. It wasn't any abstract thing. It was just that I had a job to do, and I needed the authority to do it. And it was that difficult, even under that urgent necessity, that it took that long. It for yes, it to come that's through. right, because. Uh, the, the the church had to do, change uh, the laws of the church, and you don't do that easily. There's a barrier yeah. act. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And it really is a barrier that comes forward and back to the different presbyteries and all that sort of thing. So but eventually, I, I, it got there's through. something special in being the first, and so you yes. were sort of uh, no footprints to follow, and you were making your own way. And uh, Dr. Oliver, the, uh, who was the principal of the college and had been quite uh, eager to have me uh, go into the work, he championed my cause. 
Oh, well, that and would as be As moderator, of course, he had quite an influence. He was moderator of the United Church. Of the United then, Church. Oh, well, it's and always good to have the moderator in your corner, that's for sure. Eventually, the, uh, it passed. Well, then, uh, once you were ordained, uh, did you still uh, stay out in the small rural charges, or did you go into the cities, or what? Well, at the time, I was as, uh, assistant to the minister in St. Andrew's Church, uh, Mustio. That oh, that's was my, a big my only city there. And, uh, and then uh, that was in 36. In 38, I was called to Toronto to be the uh, executive secretary of the Committee on the Deaconess Order and Women Workers of the Church that supervised all the deaconesses and uh, home missionary women and visited them and uh, that sort of thing. So then you would be working for the National Church? Yes. At the United Church House? That's right. I see. And how long did you do that kind of work? Uh, for about five years. I One see. year of that I um, I was acting principal of the uh, of the um, training school for the missionaries. Oh, I because see. Because the principal was taking postgraduate work, and I was uh, so act, you were the acting, acting principal. principal yes, well, that of the would training be a new school. experience. That, that, that was quite an experience. Yes. Oh well, that would be great. And you did that for one of those years. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, and so you'd see quite a bit of the church in action right across the country. Oh yes. Uh -huh. And uh, now when you think of the role that the church played in our country at that time and, and where it is today, we have, uh, you know, we have a lot of new Canadians in these days, the same as when you were on the prairies. Yes. And, and the church plays its role in that as well. And do you think that, that, that the church played an important role for the new Canadians? Oh, yes. Yes, I think so. Uh... I'm, it's not quite the same as the pioneer days, because at least my experience in Saskatchewan doesn't seem to correspond to anything here in British Columbia. Yes, we uh, should mention that we're in White Rock. Yes. So, and uh, where you have been living for uh, the last 23 years. That's isn't? right. Yes. I see. Well, anyway, so you went to Toronto for five years, and then did you go back to Saskatchewan again? Yes. So you were right back I, I to was where you started. I was called to Saskatchewan. And, uh, and where were you then? What uh, city? Nakam and uh, Simpson and... Uh, Those are hardly cities, but they're communities. Uh, no, they were, they, they were regular preaching charges. Preaching charges. Preaching charges. Now, were those one-point charges, or were they... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> no, I usually had two or three points. And uh, I hope by this time that you had managed to get a car. Oh, yes. You did? <laughs> yes. Did you become a me mechanic so that you could fix it as well? Oh, not too badly. Not too badly you could do no. that. And uh, and um, and by this time, people would be out of their sod shacks, uh, sod uh, houses oh, yes. that they formed. And uh, right. so you've seen quite a, a change during your ministry on the prairies. Oh yes, very much so. The uh, the early pioneer days, the people were were scattered, and they were very poor, a lot of them. And at that time, the church in Ontario sent bundles of clothing and I was able to distribute them to the uh, largely the new settlers that need it was the oh yes it was dr drought the at drought. the time as oh, well yes the drought and the depression <laughs> yes, came like the double trouble that's right so that uh, the church was doing a lot of uh, social work just as it is today. And do you think that that's an important role for our church to oh, be Oh, yes, I do, yes. You have to meet people at their point of need. And so at that time, there would be lots of physical need. Now, you were in the northern part of Saskatchewan. Was that as badly hit by the drought? Not the quite, state? but uh, no. Not or did the people come up there from the south? They, they came from the oh, south. Oh, they did? Yes. Uh -huh. And so then you'd be able to help them That's when they right, come too. there. Uh -huh. I see. And so, and then you became, you were granted your Doctor of Divinity. How yes. in the world did that happen to the first woman? My goodness. Well, that's an honor honorary degree. That's right. Certainly. Uh, so I didn't have to work for that. <laughs> oh, I think that. I think everybody has to work for that. <laughs> well, not scholastically. Yes, I didn't have to true. write any exams oh, or anything like right. that. 
it was uh, my college. Your uh, college. And, yeah. uh, and did they, in the citation, did they say what it was for? Oh, for the work I'd been doing for in the For the work church. you'd been doing. Not just that you were the first woman ordained. Oh, no. No, no. It was uh, recognizing the work that I'd been doing. Well, that's it's been a, a real part of Canadian history. So now, uh, when you stayed on, how long? In 53, I guess it was, you were granted your Doctor of Divinity. And then did you stay on in the ministry? In, in, in third... In uh, when you got your doctorate? Oh. Yes. That was in the 50s? Y yes. Uh, yes. And uh, then did you stay active in the ministry after that? Oh, yes. That? Uh -huh. yes. Yes, until I retired. Until you retired. And you stayed all the time in your beloved Saskatchewan? That's right. Well, that, that speaks very well for that. <laughs> and then you headed to the West Coast yeah. uh, to retire That's in right. White Rock, where a lot of people come to retire. Yes, I had a sister, the sister who's living with me now. Yes. They were living at, been... uh, at uh, Murrayville near, near Langley there. Oh, I So see. I used to come out in the summertime and uh, have my holidays with her, and we liked it out here. And it's a good place to retire. There's no place like a white rock for That's retiring. That's right. <laughs> well, an awful lot of people have uh, followed you out here in, in yes, that time. Uh, and so have you been active in the church since you've been out here? Well, when I came rock? out, I was in the session, and my sister Florence, I told you Florence, who was a missionary was in India. Yes. Uh, she was in the choir. And she lived with you, did she? Oh, you yes. Came we here? came out together yes, and got this little house. And, uh, and so and you were active in the I was uh, uh, active in the session until it was time for me to uh, to pull out. I'm old now, and there's a limit to what Is I can right do. Is it all right if we talk about how young you are? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be 91 in September. <laughs> well, that's that's a pretty... You're getting past middle age now. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> yes, uh, and so uh, you remained active. A lot of people in their retirement are very uh, active as supply ministers and do Oh, well, I did for quite a little while, yes. You did? Yes. But you don't anymore? No. Well, there's the time to quit, isn't there? I mean, but you had an opportunity. I can't to hear well out. enough. Uh, well, you do very well. <laughs> and uh, and in the church uh, locally, uh, do you see much difference in the makeup of the church that you attend here? But White Rock is hardly a, uh, an ordinary church. I mean, because so many people retire in this community. Well, that's it. It's it's so very different from the pioneers. <laughs> At times when everybody was young, it seems. Yes. Oh, there are a lot of differences, really. But well, the needs are very different these yes, days, uh -huh. and now they'll have two and three ministers for one church rather yes. than one minister for two or three churches. We we have a, a woman minister and two men here, and uh, this summer, uh, one of the uh, students. Uh, at college is uh, doing her intern work here. I see, too. from the Vancouver School of Theology. Not from Vancouver, she's from the East. From the East, but a theological student will be yes. here this summer, I mm -hmm. see. So there's more of that done. Uh, was that done when you were training for the ministry that you had a chance to uh, to uh, oh, no. work out in a... That wasn't done? No. I think it's quite recently that that really started to... Uh, no, we, we worked in the, the we worked in the summer. We, uh, let's see, what did I do in the summer? Oh, there were the camps and things like that. Yes, and camps were very important uh, oh, yes. in the life of the church. That's right. We have some excellent camps, and there seems to be a, a different attitude toward camps these days. Uh, they don't seem to be playing the vital role that they once did. And no. when I was a young girl, I know. Yes, right. Uh, I think they are different. We have Christian leadership training centers now. That's right. Uh, like Naramata and uh, some yes. of the East, uh -huh. like that. And so those are new developments since, uh, yes. since uh -huh. your early years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the United Church has uh, brought together quite a few denominations. And, uh, and as we know, it's a uniting church. Do you see that this is going to, in your opinion, do you think that this is going to be uh, continued to 
bring in other denominations into the church? Do you think that would be a good thing? You mean they become more ecumenical? Yes. Oh, yes. Work together. They don't have to be actually united, but uh, I think the churches are working together better. Yes, in many coalitions and things, yes. they work together a lot more than, than would seem sometimes. Yes, that's right. And now we have food banks, more in British Columbia than any province in Canada. More what? More food banks. Oh, yes. Where people are who are really having a difficult time to feed their family are going. Uh, that harkens back to the uh, 30s. That's right. In the Depression and the drug days. But the whole economic situation is so different. It, it seems amazing that in such some an affluent people, land... Uh, some people have s such huge wages and others can't get a job at all. It's so very different that... Uh, but the church is trying to meet the needs, I think. And, and uh, speaking out on some issues. Uh, yes, oh that yes. That this is... Uh, and, uh, uh, there uh, are people that feel that the church shouldn't be speaking out on these issues. Uh, am I hearing you say that you think it should continue to do so? Oh, they should. It, it should certainly speak on uh, social issues, I think. To help, to, to speak out for the voiceless, the voice yes, for the voiceless. that's right. Yes, I recall uh, people in poverty situations just asking us to go and go to these government offices with them, that they were treated so differently when someone was there. So maybe we have to be very mindful of, uh, of the hurting situation that a lot of people are in. And, yes, that's right. And uh, so it's, uh, do you see uh, anything particularly that you'd uh, like to pass on to the church, the good things that you think it should continue or new avenues you think it should be going into? Oh, I wouldn't speak of any new avenues, I don't think. But it's always a matter of uh, being very much aware of people's uh, needs, not, uh, not trying to please everybody, not that sort of thing, but to, to meet the spiritual and uh, everyday need as so much I as possible. Am I hearing you say that it's not a popularity contest that we're in? <laughs> <laughs> Just about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's a, uh, I think that in some ways the church is going back to where it was a few years ago, being much more active in youth work and, and catering to the whole family's need. Yes. And certainly in the field of Bible study, that uh, you were in Christian education for so long. Yes, that's right. Well, Dr. Gucci, you have enriched our church by your service and by your loving kindness to so many people, and we are deeply grateful to you. And uh, at this time of, uh, of celebration in our church, coming to the 60th anniversary of a thing that they never thought would work at all, you know. <laughs> this, uh, it's, it's a real joy to meet with you here in your home in White Rock, British Columbia. Thank you very much. The church has always been good to me. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, you've certainly been good to the church. And so uh, let us hope that we can look forward to another 60 years of uh, a growing, uh, caring, and sharing church. Really a marvelous woman and a real joy to meet. I know that you must have enjoyed watching that conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it. One of the things that I'm sure Reverend Grushi would be very pleased to know is that this year the BC Conference ordained five new ministers, four of them women. That's our Pressure Point program for tonight. I'm Barbara Anderson. Good evening. <laughs> A special thanks to Lois Boyce for her participation on this program.